Okay. Um, anyways, uh, as Michelle said, uh, I hope you guys had at least the, the hands-on experience. Uh, a couple of you actually did remarkably well uh, in, in racing through some of the, the samples using the Konomic software. So kudos to you for, for learning this and, and getting acquainted with it. Um, so this is part two of Metabolite ID and Annotation. And what it's now going to go is from, as Michelle said, from the idea of this manual approach to some of the other automated approaches with NMR. And then we're going to drift into GCMS, and then we're going to talk about uh, more about MS methods, uh, mass spectrometry, identifying compounds by mass, molecular weight, uh, formula generation, and other ways of identifying unknowns or known unknowns um, using largely mass spectrometry techniques. So it's important to really understand that what we, what we did just before lunch, what we're going to be doing here is the idea of taking a spectrum, NMR, GCMS, LCMS, MS, MS, DIMS, whatever, and producing a list. The list is going to have compound names and it's going to have some number associated with those compound names. It could be a relative concentration, it could be an absolute concentration. So we're not binning, we're not grouping, we're actually naming and quantifying. And that's all that's needed actually to do any of the PLSDA, PCA, uh, other statistical, multivariate statistical text, techniques that we're going to talk about mostly tomorrow. Um, so this is the this is the input that we're trying to do or generate. Now we did spectral deconvolution. You guys had the experience of, of looking at a, a real uh, biofluid sample and, and you had a chance, at least a few of it, to, to figure out where acetone was, and <coughs> DSS and alanine and maybe even citrate or a couple of other ones. And we use the Konomic software um, and it's, it's quite user-friendly. It's actually um, had lots of years of development, and I think lots of people agree that it is um, particularly uh, user-friendly. There are other alternatives, and I'm going to race through a few of them. Um, I've already mentioned uh, Top Spin Amix, which is done by Brooker. It's a commercial uh, package. Um, we can't afford it, so we're not using it. <laughs> um, then there's the Metabo Miner. Uh, that's some freeware that uh, Jeff actually wrote, your TA. Um, there's also tools that are available through the Human Metabolome Database. Uh, there are other tools available uh, through Wisconsin, uh, Madison's Biomag Res Bank. Okay, um, so uh, Metabo Miner uh, was developed. Um, a few years back, and the link might be a little out of date, but it's still around. Anyways, it's a downloadable software, and it was actually developed um, to, to look at 2D NMR. So you guys were looking at one-dimensional NMR spectra, but there's a, just like with 2D gel electrophoresis, there's 2D chromatography, you can do two-dimensional NMR, and it actually allows you to see many, many more compounds. And it works with things that are called TOXI, uh, Total Correlation Spectroscopy, as well as HSQC spectra. Um, so it has its own library, just like Konomics has its own library. It has sub-libraries that are specific for certain biofluids. And just like you guys had a list of compounds to work with with the CSF sample, uh, this also knows what's supposed to be in CSF for plasma or urine. Uh, Jeff did some really neat things which other people have sort of adopted since then because he was a few years ahead of his time and had developed ideas of minimal signature peaks to identify pairs or clusters that allow you to identify things. Um, and it uses a couple of other tricks to make sure that the compounds can be identified. In principle, and it's largely agreed by almost all spectroscopists, that if you can look at two-dimensional NMR spectra, it is more reliable than trying to do one-dimensional NMR spectra. Uh, the annotation, the identification is much better. Unfortunately with 2D spectra it takes a long time to collect them. So the spectra you guys were looking at took about three minutes to five minutes to collect. To collect a TOX or HSQC spectrum would take several hours. 
And so if you're trying to do 500 samples, it's a lot of time. The other thing is that, that two-dimensional NMR data is not as quantitative as 1D NMR data. So 2D data is for identification, but not so much for quantification. Anyways, we, we did a number of tests, and, and if Jeff was here, he could tell you how long it took him to do these tests. But um, it's able, so this is, this is essentially semi-automated semi-automated, so you don't have to do all of the phasing you guys were worrying about and all the other stuff. So you can just sort of upload this. And it was hovering around about 90% correct in, in terms of its precision and recall, um, looking at both TOXI and HSQC, and it was identifying 30, 35 compounds in a sample. Um, so that actually got people intrigued with the idea that it might be possible to automate what you guys just spent your morning doing. So that's one example, and as I say, Tableau Miner is still used, it's sort of cited as one of the first examples where we, we had this opportunity to do sort of semi-automation. Now, NMR compound ID is also supported by the Human Metabolome Database. Um, it allows you to, to type in lists of chemical shifts and um, it'll look up its collection of, of NMR spectra, and it has a collection of about 1,000 uh, compounds that have been analyzed and assigned. It also has a whole bunch of predicted NMR spectra as well. And so if you type in a bunch of chemical shifts, uh, just like what you saw, so you could have just used Konomics or any regular software, and just identified, here's a peak at 1.72 ppm, here's another peak at 1.86 ppm, here's another one at 1.92 ppm, and typed in those things, um, the HMDB would be able to look through its library of chemical shifts and putatively provide you a list with, with some compounds. Now, this is not as good or as reliable as Konomics. It is not as good or as reliable as the... Um, uh, other software, which I'll mention. But it is sort of a, a point of, if you want, last resort um, if you're just trying to identify uh, something that you're uncertain of. If you're working with a reasonably pure compound that you've isolated and you're trying to figure out what it might be, this is also something you can use. Um, and that's probably where it's had its most greatest utility. Um, University of Wisconsin um, also developed a, an NMR uh, suite and set of databases, part of their Biomag ResBank uh, initiative. Um, this is led by John Markley. And although they've sort of pulled away from NMR-based metabolomics the last few years, they, they did produce some, some good software. So one is NMR analysis software <coughs> written in R. So you guys had a bit of your tutorials on R, and there's lots of techniques and tricks um, that are available uh, through R, both for data analysis and, and even graphing. So they've done this, and it, it actually was intended uh, to help with um, metabolomic data processing. Uh, I'm not sure how far it's gone. I, I was talking with the developer, I think, a year ago, and he was planning on upgrading it and making it a little more useful. Uh, but it's more intended, just like um, our Metabo Miner, uh, largely for two-dimensional NMR analysis. Just like the HMDB, uh, the folks in Wisconsin have created a, a, another thing called the BMRB Peak Server, where you can type in a whole bunch of chemical shifts, and they'll look up their library of, of compounds to see if they can find any matches. They have a different library than what's in the Human Metabolome database. Uh, some of them overlap. There's maybe about 60% overlap. Uh, a lot of the compounds in the Biomag ResBank are actually plant metabolites. Um, and so those are useful, especially if you are doing plant metabolomics. Uh, and as I say, if you can't find one in HMDB, you can probably go into the BMRB and vice versa. Uh, so they have both proton and carbon uh, HSQC data. So these are, uh, as I say, services. Um, they're not um, blockbusters, but there are two things that have become, I guess I would call blockbusters for NMR. So one is a, a package called Batman. This is produced by Tim Ebel's group uh, out of Imperial College. 
It's also written in R, um, and it stands for Bayesian Automated Metabolite Analysis uh, for NMR. Uh, and you can take the B and the A and pull out a T somewhere and eventually get Batman out of it. Um, this was the first software that really claimed to do automated metabolite identification for NMR. So you guys had to do, well, it didn't do the phasing, didn't do the water correction, doesn't do the baseline correction, but the stuff where you're profiling, this is where it would do it. Uh, and so some of you tried to do the auto fit on Konomics. This is sort of like auto fit, except it does it um, more automatically. The problem is, it takes about nine hours to analyze a spectrum. So even if you guys are just learning, you could still work faster than Batman. Uh, so it's not so much uh, an advance in the sense that, uh, I mean, yes, maybe if you had a big supercomputer it would be faster, but it, it's just not quite practical in, in that regard. Why does it take so long? The, well, the the, um, why do you need to spend, spend nine hours? It's the computer, just oh, okay. grinding so away, so trying to fit. Okay. A simple spectrum, if you can get a very simple spectrum with about a, a dozen compounds in it, it can do it in about, um, about 20 minutes. And if you can be quite selective before, so you go through the spectrum and say, I just want this, I just want this. Uh, so you could take the CSF spectrum. You could also do it in about uh, maybe half an hour, or at least the computer could take it. But by then you're, you're doing so much manual work because you've already had to do the phasing and all the, the baseline correction, and then you're also isolating these peaks, then it doesn't really pay off. And I think they admit to that. But the concept is there, the idea that you can automate it. Um, so, yes, question. Sorry, is that the main of one? One spectrum. <laughs> so, um, we've been working on a thing called Basil. Um, and uh, this is actually on the web. And if you guys wanted to flip out your laptops, you could actually go to the website. Um, hasn't been published yet. Just submitted the paper, I think, today or maybe tomorrow is when it's supposed to go in. Uh, this one's a lot faster. So what would have taken uh, Batman nine hours, this one takes about uh, three minutes. It's very accurate. Um, and the other thing is everything is automated. So all of the baseline correction, all the phasing, all of the water removal, reference identification, uh, all of that is automated. And that took a long time to figure that one out. The other part was to try and do the fitting very quickly. So a skilled person could have analyzed the CSF sample that you guys looked at in about 15 minutes. And the idea was to then, you know, if, if a human can do it, surely a computer should be able to do it just as fast. And so the idea is to mimic what a human typically does. And the way that we do things is, is we pick low-hanging fruit first, and then the higher fruit later. And that's a pretty practical way of doing it. But you can't code that in easily for global fits. The way to do this was to use something called a hidden Markov model um, or a probabilistic graphical model. Yeah, so HMMs are, are things that are used in pattern recognition, speech recognition, um, and um, this one is essentially was what was used, uh, a few other tricks. Um, and uh, the net result is it fits the way an expert tends to fit. Uh, the other thing is that you can't just give it a, a carte blanche. You have to tell it, just like we gave you guys, you have to give it a hint. You have to tell it it's looking at blood, or you have to tell it you're looking at CSF, tell it that you're looking at saliva or whatever, and it knows what compounds are typically found in those biofluids. So once that prior knowledge is there, that's part of the Bayesian component, then it can do the rest. And as I say, it does it very, very quickly. So just like you, uh, it does the processor and the profiler. So if you run the website and some of the examples on there, it'll come up with a, initially a crummy looking spectrum that's all out of phase. Then it will phase it. 
so you can see the phasing is done. Then it will remove the water. As you can see at the bottom, the water is gone. It'll also identify the zero point position, so it's got the zero ppm. It's also fixed up the baseline and all the other things that you guys took a while to do. And then at that stage, it can start deconvoluting. So, you know, top is what human would do, 60 minutes bottom. If you're running on a faster computer like this one rather than a server, it's about 30 seconds to a minute. So, so the server is about, I think, three minutes or whatever. Um, so that's, that's automated. And I think, as Michelle said, to appreciate, if we just simply said, oh, here's the automation, everything's simple, uh, you wouldn't understand how much work this has taken uh, or appreciate what the computer does. Um, this has actually taken us 10 years to develop. Yes? So you said it wouldn't specify if you were looking at loud slide or here. Why is that possible with the motion Um, you're saying that you should have it search through the, a library of, say, 200 compounds yes. or something like that. So, so the reason is you want to minimize the number of compounds that it's looking at. And it's a case of you've got a few thousand peaks that you're trying to fit, and you've got, if this is 200 compounds, then it's, it's 8,000 times 200 in combinations. If it's 50 compounds and 8,000 peaks, then it's, it's a fewer, smaller number of combinations to look at. So it reduces the problem um, and, and speeds it up, in that case by sort of a factor of four. But it also is an issue where there's a, a huge amount of overlap. So we have tried very hard, uh, but we can't get the system to work for urine. Urine is too complicated. There's about 150 to 200 compounds in urine. It can work for simpler spectra, for CSF, cell extracts, saliva, fecal water, anything with about 70 compounds or less. So beyond that, it's too complicated. There's some tricks, higher field instruments, uh, more powerful computer, uh, other ideas that we have. And so maybe a year from now, we'll have that one figured out. But uh, it was our goal, <laughs> was to get urine done, but it just didn't work. Uh, at least not not at this stage. So it's extremely difficult computationally. So when this is what, let's say that you set up here and you just want to, because some of them are taken out in urine and saliva and in blood would be still present in the sample. So you can still use it. Kind of yes, you, you could potentially uh, put in a urine sample into this and just tell it it's serum and it'll try it its best, and it'll fit those 50 compounds that it's expecting. Um, and it, it would probably do okay. Um, the thing about uh, urine and some of the other things, especially in NMR, is you have to be very certain about your pH, and you also have to try and remove, particularly in urine, divalent metals, magnesium, calcium. They cause some very unexpected shifts in, in peaks, and so best route is to add a, a small amount of EDTA to the sample. So those are protocol issues, um, and if, if the, those aren't handled, then it becomes very difficult for the computer to do it. Humans, we can do that. We, we can look for patterns that are shifted, but computer, as I say, it's, it's pretty bad at straightening pictures uh, on the wall. So there are still advantages with automation. This is why the effort, this is why we spent so long at it. This is why we're kind of happy with what we're getting at least so far. This is why other groups are doing this. Uh, there's a group in Finland that's recently published another one that looks to help. So it's a lot faster, 30 to 60 times faster. It's pretty accurate. The point is it's something that you can press a button, batch load, go home, sleep, and answer or the paper's written for you the next morning. The other point is that, as Carolina mentioned, is we don't have this differential bias that every one of you, as I was looking as you were doing your baseline fits and doing your phasing, every one of you had slightly different spectra. Some were, you know, blowing up to the, you know, I could see the noise all the way covering your screen. Others had 
you could just barely see the water peak. Uh, so some were, you know, zooming in, and others were, were sort of just saying, oh, this looks good enough to me. So there's different levels between what we say is good, and, and so that reduces that bias or potential user errors. Um, and we have found that actually it picks up things that we miss. And we know this because we ran the example and it said, oh, this must be wrong. And then we went back and said, no, the computer was right, we were wrong. And that's happened more than a few times. So this is, um, this is the advantage of, of actually having a computer do that sort of thing. Okay, I'm going to switch from NMR to GCMS. And I think this is maybe where people perk up again. Um, at least this is more familiar with most of you. Um, so we've seen the different chromatograms that are produced by LCMS and GCMS. And so uh, you know, a, a total ion chromatogram for GCMS is typically shown in that top left corner there. Um, and we'll see some peaks. Uh, we'll typically see 50, 60, 70 peaks that are clearly identifiable. Uh, in any given GCMS system. What we tend to forget is that any one of those peaks, or under those peaks, can be a single pure compound, but more often than not, several compounds. And that's illustrated below, where we'll see one peak, when black, but three other peaks that sum together uh, to produce the one large black peak which says, in fact, there are three compounds under this apparent single peak. Furthermore, we can collect the MS spectra from these ones, and so each of them has a unique mass spectrum associated with it. A blue mass spectrum, a red mass spectrum, and a turquoise mass spectrum. So what we have to do in GCMS is we have to not only deconvolute the peak, but then we have to do the <coughs> spectral comparison, just like we did in Konomics. So you could imagine that these are now equivalent to NMR spectra, like what you were doing, except now these are mass spec. And just like Konomics had its own library of 450 spectra to look up here, or with GCMS, you'll have a large library of mass spec. And the point is to compare these spectra to your database. So we've got three colored spectra, and we're going to look at all the black <laughs> spectra on the far right. And if you look close enough, and this is where human pattern matching is very good, you can see the very top spectrum matches identically with the, the, the blue one. The middle one matches the, with the red one, and the bottom spectrum in our library matches with the, the turquoise one. In this case, these compounds are from pure reference compounds, so we know, this, know what they are. The top one might have been alanine, the middle one might have been adenine, and the last one might have been citric acid. I don't know. But at least at that stage, you've identified your compounds. So in GCMS, we use electron ionization, or EI, or electron impact ionization, different names. And so the net result is we fragment molecules into component ions. So even almost the simplest molecule, methanol, generates almost half a dozen different peaks, each corresponding to a, a fragment. And because we conduct electron impact ionization with a standard protocol, standard voltage, standard flow rate, standard electrodes, everything standard, it means the spectra are highly reproducible. That means the libraries are valid. Same thing with the Konomics NMR libraries, highly reproducible or valid for every compound, every instrument. So a standard mass spectrum from a GC uh, instrument is typically you will have uh, a largest mass on the leftmost side is typically your molecular ion. And then you'll have to the left of that the fragment ions. So this is very much like an MS-MS spectrum, which we'll talk about later. Um, if you have, if you use not just EI, but you use chemical ionization, uh, you can also end up with uh, sometimes a gas adduct uh, or an adduct ion. In that case, that ion's shifted to the right. So GCMS, it's either EI, in some cases it's chemical ionization, but the vast majority is EI. 
So just remember there's the molecular ion, which is usually the, the highest molecular weight, and then there's all these fragments that you detect afterwards. Now when I was talking about GCMS, um, I mentioned, this is in the morning, that we have to derivatize most compounds. We have to make them volatile so they will fly. Uh, the way that we standardly do this is, is adding TMS, whether it's other ones like TBDMS, uh, or compound that Celis's group uses, Carolina, is it MSTF or what's the one? MCF. MCF? Okay. So there's a, a number of, of routes that allow you to make compounds um, evaporate at, at modestly high temperatures. These compounds will react to different groups, hydroxyl groups, amine groups, um, also to ketone groups. Um, and the net result is that you have changed the chemical character of your compound. Um, so if you had glutamic acid or uh, citric acid or something like that, um, you're going to get TMS uh, glomming onto the molecule and maybe you'll get two, citric, uh, two TMSs or three TMSs or one or two or three T TBDMSs or maybe you'll get a methoxine addition. Um, so the compound that's actually being analyzed is not the original one that you, uh, original metabolite. So you have to remember that um, and you have to look at that parent ion mass with that modification. Derivatization is not clean, not 100%, and so in GCMS you'll often end up with um, four peaks uh, for the same compound. One with one TMS, another one with two TMSs, a third with three TMSs, um, but it's still the same parent compound, so you don't want to get confused with that. GCMS is, is used a lot. In fact, it was the original technique, I think, when metabolomics first sort of dawned on, on the, the world in 1999. Uh, and several groups in Germany were using it. Um, it's suited for compounds that are less than in about 500 Daltons. It, it's not, it has, never was really designed for really large molecules. Uh, people use them a lot for amino acids, fatty acids. Uh, you can detect a number of sugars with GCMS. Uh, but obviously it's not good for lipids because uh, they're too big. Uh, and so you have to do some different techniques if you want to characterize lipids by GCMS. I've mentioned this before and I'll mention again. Gas chromatography is better than liquid chromatography. Far more reproducible, far more precise, higher plate counts. Um, that's why we can rely on retention indices and report them and use them around the world. Now, the thing about GCMS is the fact that we use a standardized mass spectrum analysis. That is, we use standard ionization mode. So it means that all the EI spectra that have been collected around the world are comparable. So when people analyze GCMS data, they can use the same concept that we just did with Konomics which is nice. Um, you can deconvolute, it's standardized, um, doesn't really matter about the system. And instead of Konomics, the tool is called AMDIS and NIST. So, what's that? So NIST is the National Institute for Standards. It's maintained in the U.S. and they've been collecting over the last 30 or 40 years uh, spectra and they've been archiving that. And it's a huge number of spectra, a quarter million EI spectra in the NIST 11 database. Um, they've also done other things. They've done QTOF, triple quad, ion trap mass spec for a large number of compounds. They've collected retention index values, again, almost a quarter million RI values for, for many different compounds. Now, a lot of the compounds are different TMS derivatives, so it's not as if they've, you know, found 200,000 metabolites or something like that. This is one TMS derivative, two TMS derivative. They also have other derivatization techniques. So if we're talking about the original compounds, it's maybe on the order of, I don't know, 20 or 30,000 compounds. The other thing to remember is that a lot of these compounds in NIST are not metabolites. Uh, they're synthetic compounds. Uh, they're pollutants, toxins, exotic synthetics. So it's not necessarily going to be your 
number one reference for um, uh, metabolomic data. It wasn't intended to be, but it's still a rich, rich resource. You can use the NIST software to search for compounds, uh, and it'll give you masses, it'll give you names of the compounds. Um, you can look at how some of the mass spec are matching. Uh, it's, it's quite rich in terms of the information. Um, and then the other part to the, the NIST equation is this tool called AMDIS. So AMDIS ca ca is, is an acronym for Automated Mass Spectral Deconvolution and Identification System. It's quite old. The concept is quite old. Um, but it does a number of the things that we kind of saw in Konomics. And the reason why we're not going to use this is, again, it costs money, and we would have had to have bought, I don't know, $18,000 worth of software for you guys, which we can't afford. So I'm just going to tell you how it sort of works. <laughs> um, how many of you have ever used AMDIS? One? Okay. <laughs> and it actually costs more than $1,000. So, um, But it does do things just like what economics, so you can do some background noise analysis. Um, it identifies which ones are real peaks. We do this uh, by eye with Konomics. Basil does peak identification on its own, so this is also sort of like AMDIS. Does its own spectral deconvolution, so it takes some of these big lumpy peaks, pulls out the mass spec from them um, to generate what are called clean or model spectra, and it presents options for you to say, I identify this compound. So it's not totally automated, you still have to be manually assessing things. Again, not unlike what you were doing with Konomics. It uses a thing called a match factor. So this is how it quantitatively reports the, the degree of similarity of the mass spectrum that it has deconvolved or pulled out from your GCMS data with the reference database. So we'll go back here so by your eyes, you can say, yes, that one's similar, that one's similar, that one's similar. But how similar? Is it 98%, 62%? You want to quantify that. And that's what AMDIS does. And it does it through this match factor. It's like a score. It's their score, yeah. And it, it depends on which version, but it's, it's out of 1,000. So 960 is very good, 55 is very bad. Um, anyways, it's, it's a dot product of the query, QRY, and the reference mass and intensity values. So it just tries to match each of the mass values uh, that it's seeing and the intensity values that it's seeing between the query and the reference one. Um, it's mathematically what our eyes do when we're matching spectra. And so it does produce this value, uh, which is between 0 and 1, and then you multiply it by 1,000 to get their overall score. So if you want to do GCMS, um, there's a few things you typically have to do. Um, first thing you typically want to do with your brand new GCMS instrument is you, and with a typical run, if it's at the beginning of the week or even at the beginning of the day, is you'll run some alkane standards. Um, these are the calibration standards that allow you to determine the standard retention indices, RI. So you can buy these commercially. Uh, they're pretty standard, and you can inject them into your uh, GCMS. And that allows you to get uh, references so that, that everything will have exactly the same uh, retention or appropriate retention index. The other thing you want to do is, because in GCMS you're dealing with derivatizations, chemicals, messy stuff, um, you usually run a blank sample. This would represent just the solvent and the derivatization agent. So these are the only other things that have presumably been added. Um, so this will sort of generate a bunch of peaks. But these are things that you want to subtract from your normal GCMS uh, spectrum. Um, and then you run your sample of interest. And that's the one that's been derivatized, and you run it through. So you, you have the reference standards, 
for calibration. You can have a blank sample to get rid of sort of the noise, just like when you do a, a UV run on, on a blank sample. Um, and then the sample of interest. So the alkane standards give you uh, a set of points, retention times. Um, these are running between, say, 2 and 10 minutes. You can give longer standards, different running conditions. They could go for up to half an hour. But they serve as reference points that allow you to say that um, this time on this machine and this column corresponds to this time on another occasion for these compounds, which then allows you to give you this normalized retention index. That retention index is universal, uh, or nearly so. So once you have a calibration file with your retention uh, indices, um, you will take your sample data, the one that you've just run, and recalibrate with your retention index calibration file. So that gives you your retention index for every compound in your urine or your blood or your plant sample. So you now have peaks with proper retention indexes or indices, and then you can start running NIST um, and AMDIS to start identifying and matching. You can also get rid of some of the false positives by comparing the blank against your spectrum, and that saves you time. So with AMDIS, this is how you would create your CAL file with your alkane standards. It's, again, can't show it live because you can't afford the license. Um, and um, once that calibration standard has been run, then you, you take your urine or blood or plant sample, and it will calibrate generating all of those um, values with, with proper retention indices. The, the NIST search then is one where you're letting AMDIS, or your NIST database, let AMDIS identify in you know, peaks from noise, uh, deconvolute the peak. So what's marked here in red is, is a peak. Um, and that peak might correspond to this retention time slash retention index. And then under that peak, which is marked in white, are three colored peaks. A red peak, a yellow peak, and a blue peak. And they actually have uh, corresponding to distinct masses. 73 Daltons, 58 Daltons, and 172 Daltons. So that allows you to, in essence, sort out the, the, the spectrum. Um, as you zero in a little more, we can actually see this, but what it's doing is uh, the most abundant ones are the ones, this is actually, maybe as we shift a little bit more, but we're seeing 73, in this case 144, are clearly the most abundant. So they must be part of the same spectrum. With the AMDIS software, you can actually calculate the match factor to see this, whether this particular spectrum that we pulled out matches anything in the database. And in this case, uh, it actually matches valine, the amino acid. And we can be more confident by comparing this retention index or time, 19.6, to the retention index that's already in uh, AMDIS, and maybe it's 19.65. So we've got a nice match with retention index, and we've got a very nice match with the spectrum. 218, 203, uh, 156, 144, 133, 73. These are all features, and, and we can be pretty confident based on the match of the retention index, which is in NIST, and the match to the mass spectrum, or the match factor, that this must be valine. Now note that valine is indicated, but it's also a trimethyl silo valine. So it's, it's been modified. So NIST has cataloged all the compounds, not just as valine, but all the TMS derivatives. Does that make sense in terms of how we're, how we're matching, fixing, identifying? Can you repeat that? The yellow, blue, and red spectrum, uh, graph. What does that represent? 
So these essentially correspond to um, masses or you Okay, you pick the seven degree mass yeah. and then you add the different points. So 73 blue, 144 red, and then there's a yellow at 130, looks like, or is it 187? Oh, I those are the times, sorry. So those okay. are, is that the tip? <coughs> so we've taken this red, or I've marked the red, so that particular peak, which is 19.6 or something, Yeah. and then we've blown it up, and we've deconvolved okay, that, that right. peak. Okay. And it turns out it's largely just one mass spectrum, but there's one other one in yellow, very tiny, um, which isn't failing or anything else. It's just too weak. Okay. Um, it might be the one that's just to the right of it a little bit. And maybe we'll see that in the peak or it's another compound. So in this case, it looks like it's mostly pure valine and not much else. Uh, it could have been more complicated. We could have had a few more compounds hidden underneath of it. So you, you have, as long as it's 60% match factor and above, it's good, good confidence? Or is there like a yeah. better confidence and not so confidence? Yeah. Some people will use 60%. Um, that's what they recommend. Uh, generally, in our lab, we usually do like 80% or 800. Uh, there are cases where if you've got really nice match to the retention index and maybe only a 65% match on the mass, but you say, okay, two pieces of evidence are pretty good. Obviously, you'd like to have a perfect match on retention index and a perfect match on the, on the um, mass spec. But th there are issues here where the reference spectra were collected on different instruments um, uh, with different sampling rates. Um, some of the spectra that AMDIS has in its reference library aren't great, um, or NIST. Um, and then there's other subtleties with um, contaminants and how AMDIS has deconvolved things, perhaps imperfectly. So you'll have a couple things that'll that'll will prevent you from getting that perfect match. Colin? Yeah, I mean, so that's one sample. Do you get any confidence in looking at all of your samples and saying, well, okay, it's maybe about 60 of the samples, but you've got better? Yeah. That's, that's it exactly. And I think this is just like with the canomics thing that you guys did. Um, as you've done one, then you start doing others. Or if you've got, you know you're looking at essentially blood, and you'll have a working list. And these are all the compounds that we'll always find. And we'll also have a retention index for a lot of those compounds. So typically, in our operation, we spend a lot of time, if we've got a brand new sample, say, worm blood or something, you know, something we've never seen before. We'll spend a long time, several days, just trying to make sure we can characterize all of it. We'll read up the literature, see if anyone else has got some stuff. We try and have a, a written list, usually handwritten, of what we should see. And we'll also try and make sure we've got the retention indices sorted out for some of these compounds. And yes, once we know that, then it becomes much more routine. Um, and and you have much more confidence about whether 65% is acceptable or, or not. Um, but this is, this is an issue for people uh, where uh, you'll just sort of dive in and say, oh, it doesn't matter which sample. You know, I've gone from human blood to a plant to some microbial thing and boom, boom, boom. No, each of these takes a fair bit of time. In our laboratory, we have standard lists of, of all of the major samples that we've ever analyzed. So there's a reference list that we can look up so that we, we know what to look for. Um, and I, I think that's, that's, that's critical for doing good work in a lab anyways. So a lot of GCMS work is manual. I mean, yes, AMDIS is semi-automatic, but it's, it's a lot of work. And we've had examples in our lab where we were trying to analyze a thousand samples by AMDIS and NIST, and a lot of people went insane. Uh, so we went into trying to come up with an auto-fit system. Um, there are other tools, other people use um, uh, things 
other than Amdis. Um, Analyzer Pro and Chromatoff are two examples. A anyone has used these, or tried to use them? What's your preference? You like Chromatoff? Anyways, they, there was an evaluation where they compared Amdis, Analyzer Pro, and Chromatoff. Um, I think in this one they, they claim the Analyzer Pro one, but it's six years ago, so some of them have gotten better. Um, the Amdis one hasn't changed. <laughs> They just, they've put it out there, it's been out there for decades, and they just, I don't think, care to change it. But it was so far ahead of the field when it first came out, I think they just got kind of lazy. Um, there are other databases out there that are much more uh, oriented towards metabolomics. So Oliver Fien uh, has developed a, the FeenLib database. Uh, a lot of that was sold to Lico and Agilent, but it's also, I think, sort of accessible now. Um, through his websites. And then the GOM database is an open access one, and it's maintained in Germany. Um, so uh, the GC Autofit software um, is something that was developed uh, by one of our staff, uh, Gam Su Han. Um, and uh, it takes you know, the sample, it takes the blank, it takes the alkyne standards, just like we talked about before with, with AMDIS and NIST. Uh, but it will take multiple spectra. So then with multiple spectra, it can do auto-alignments. Uh, you guys will learn about this with XCMS tomorrow. Uh, it can do you know, the retention time calculation. It'll do the peak integration, which relates to the area. It'll also calculate the concentrations. It can work with a whole bunch of file formats that are pretty standard with GCMS. And it takes anywhere from a few seconds to a minute. So on average, about 20 seconds per spectrum, depending on how frequently the data has been sampled and how long the spectral run has been. And with that you can identify between 45 and 70 compounds. So that's about as good as what you guys are doing with say NMR and the accuracy is up around 95 percent. Um, it doesn't work for everything just like with the NMR um, and basal and these other things. They have to be oriented to sort of common biofluids or common samples, sort of trained or optimized for them. So this one is largely working with human samples, but it's also not too hard to move it to other types of systems. Again, this hasn't been published, but um, probably next year we'll have a, a lab where we'll actually go through this one, just as we will have a, probably a basal lab, which we'll go through with NMR. So as I mentioned, there are these other alternatives uh, AMDIS to, uh, to AMDIS, like Chromatoff and Analyzer Pro, and other databases like the GOLM database. GOLM one is really important. Uh, it was one of the very first uh, spectral databases made for metabolomics. They collect the data with GC quadrupole instruments and GC TOF instruments. They have uh, mass spectra and retention index data for lots of metabolites. So unlike NIST, which took everything, this is about metabolites. It's many plant metabolites, but it's a large number. It's 1,400. Um, so there's other spectra that are linked to unknown analytes, uh, which there's, a lot of them are still unknown, but at least they allow you to say, I've got the same sort of thing in my sample as they do. Uh, they're formatted samples. The data are compatible with NIST and with AMDIS, so you can upload their data and make that part of your NIST AMDIS tool set. As I said, it's mostly plant metabolites, but there's a fair bit in common between even plants and humans and microbes and plants. This is just a screenshot of the GOM database. Uh, they've changed it a lot. Um, it used to be one of the worst and least user-friendly websites I'd ever seen, uh, but finally I think they got someone who knew how to build a website. Um, so there are tools that allow you to do searches. Uh, you can search by compound names. Um, you can select by cast number. You can choose molecular mass, other things. So that's, that's a new addition. Um, you can do spectral library searches. So here's an input spectrum in their format, and you can do a, a search through that. Um, so uh, whether it's the regular search or MS analysis, those are now much more accessible and much more usable. Uh, Oliver Fiend's library, the GCMS database, uh, like GOLM, it has retention index data. Like GOLM, it has MS data. 
Uh, it has about a thousand compounds, so about three quarters of what GOM has. Um, very broad coverage, um, a bit more mammalian centric or human centric. And the data is of sufficiently high quality that, that a number of companies have, have used it and make that part of their central library. So it's important to remember that these, the GOM and the FeenLib databases are for metabolomics, whereas the NIST library was, was never intended for metabolomics. It just happens to be defaulted. Um, I, think, I think NIST continues to try and expand it and, and understands its role in metabolomics. So then there's the LCMS. Um, and like GCMS, uh, spectral issue, I mean, you can take both examples that I showed, they're largely the same. Uh, same issue with one peak can often mean several compounds. Uh, we look at the spectra underneath the peaks and we match them to reference spectra. The issue with LCMS is we don't have this incredibly reliable index called the retention index. Retention time means almost nothing <coughs> in LCMS uh, unless you're working in exactly the same lab, doing, running exactly the same column, exactly the same thing every, every day. But be comparing between labs, comparing between databases, it's hopeless. Similarly, many of the mass spectra, uh, ESIMS, also are not comparable between systems. There's no standardized method for uh, ionization or collision-induced decay. Um, so that does make it a, a little more challenging. According to Metabolomics Society, they came up with the Metabolomics Standard Initiative, and they proposed four different levels for metabolite identification. And this system still persists, and it was largely at, under the motivation of people who were doing LCMS. So it was not uh, people doing NMR didn't have much of a say, and people do, doing GCMS didn't have much of a say. So what they identified is that the highest level is a positively identified compound where you match the compound to an authentic standard. The standard has to exist in your lab. You measure it, you run it on the same spectrometer on the same conditions, and you see identical peaks. The next level down is called a putatively identified compound, and that's where you match both to the mass and retention time, so an accurate mass to like 2 ppm or an MS-MS spectrum and the retention time, or retention index. The third level down is called compound identified by mass, um, or putatively identified uh, as a compound class. Now, this one they've had a lot of debate about. So some people just simply say, I can identify that it's an organic acid, OK. But where this category is essentially become is the catch-all for anything that's identified by mass alone. And this is where about 98% of all metabolomics is sitting right now. Almost all of the mass descriptions, all the compound descriptions, are at what I would call in this third category, where we're identifying compounds based purely on the mass. We're not using retention index data, we're not using MS-MS data, and we're not using a standard. This is really problematic, and it's something that we're trying to teach you not to do. Um, and then the lowest class is saying, I have a feature. So it's an unknown compound. And that also accounts for 90, 95% of the data that's being dumped into metabolomics databases or described, particularly by vendors, where they say, I've got this wonderful new instrument, and I can see 10,000 features, or 15,000 features. Um, as I'll show you later, about 80 to 90 percent of that is pure noise or garbage. Um, there are many cases of unknown compounds. We just haven't identified them. Um, but that's, um, that's a separate issue. So, we need to be up here, these top two, and we need to avoid these ones. Unfortunately, most of the metabolomics is stuck around this 
bottom end here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and so, but there are cases where there are polar and nonpolar compounds, and you can fairly easily distinguish between something that comes off in the void volume and something that is retained. Uh, and, okay, so this is on that, that retention time that somebody else, someone published retention time that you say this compound is possibly possible because this is retained in something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this definition is sort of evolving, and they want to rewrite some of it, partly to accommodate the fact that there's other modalities for detecting compounds, and the fact that there's been this unfortunate trend to essentially identifying everything purely by the mass. Um, so if our databases that we're comparing to only have a thousand things in their database, so how do we, are, if we were supposed to be contributing to that to build that database, or how can we say we have 1,500 metabolites in our sample, there's only a thousand in the database to compare? Yeah. So my advice to you is only report the things that you can positively identify. Stick with 200. Um, we're so anxious, I think, to try and, and it's again partly driven by vendors, partly driven by certain groups, to push towards claiming we've, we've, we've seen all these things. Um, our own experience when we've taken, quote, untargeted data, working with compounds that have been identified purely by mass, and then when we tried to validate them, they weren't there. And that's happened not just to us, but many, many groups. I, I think we can say unequivocally it's a failure. It's a failure in the approach. There's no point continuing with that. I think what we need to do is, as a community, work towards getting either more authentic standards, but also just be satisfied with identifying 200, 500, maybe 1,000 compounds be satisfied with quantifying them as well. If you can quantify and identify even just 200 compounds, you're doing about 10 times better than what most people do in proteomics. So, you know, it's just, we haven't as a community, either in proteomics, metabolomics, transcriptomics, done a really good job about thinking about quantitation. And yes, metabolomics, we can be frustrated by the fact we're not identifying thousands. But if we've positively identified them, um, then we can have much more confidence about the biology we're thinking about, about the biomarkers we're claiming, uh, about the discoveries we're eventually making. I think there's a tremendous opportunity for people to uh, expand these libraries, uh, to prepare more authentic compounds as a community effort. Um, I mean, it's partly how we sequenced a lot of the human genome. It was a community effort for many, many years. It's how we sequenced most bacteria community effort. And we just haven't thought about that for a long time uh, because of these mega projects. Um, so I think it is important that we, we need to start, if we want to expand, if we want to go beyond 1,000, if every one of us could characterize one compound each, that's 18 new compounds for the community. That's a, another thousand scientists, that's another thousand compounds for the community. So LCMS, which differs from GCMS, usually you'll find that it's, it's better for things like lipids, hydrophobic molecules. People have been quite successful for larger compounds. Um, you can see the bases, you can see amino acids, some of the things that aren't so obvious for GCMS. Um, to do the identification properly, you need MS data. You ideally want MS-MS data. You also want retention time information, other pieces, and ideally you want the authentic standard or internal standard. What people, as I say, still continue to do, and I'll show you how to do it, but not recommend it, uh, is to do mass matching to figure out what it's there. 
At least it gives you more than nothing, but it's not something to hang your hat on. So different tools, different resources. Uh, Kebby, PubChem, ChemSpider, HMDB. All of these support molecular weight searches. Um, so PubChem uh, has an interface which isn't the most convenient, but you can search for certain masses, say from 89.000 to 89.099 AMU. So that's how you'd code in your search uh, in PubChem. And you press go and boom, you get 400 answers. Now PubChem is our largest collection of compounds. Um, it is one that a lot of people use, um, but I think somewhat naively. Only 1% of the compounds in PubChem are natural products. Everything else is synthetic. That means 99% of the stuff shouldn't be in your sample. The problem is you don't know what's synthetic and what's natural, unless you're a very good chemist or have an amazing memory. Um, some people can look at the names and say, yeah, that looks like it's a, a real compound. It's got to be a natural cob product. But No, it's not very obvious. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, their intent wasn't really to serve the metabolomics community. It was really to serve the chemistry community. Um, and so there are people that are trying to see if they can winnow down PubChem and identify natural products, partly by similarity to other known natural products. Uh, some of the information based on the source library that they were accessed can kind of give you a hint that it might be a natural product. Um, so they do have the natural product database set, I think, that they grabbed. And so, okay, you could grab that one and say, okay, that's my natural product. But some of these could be really exotic plants found only in, you know, obscure desert areas in, in southern Sahara. And so you're not going to find that in any of us. Um, so, again, it's kind of useless. And especially some really strange medicinal plants where there's lots of really cool compounds, but, again, no one eats them. Not going to be finding them in our in our bodies, so this is a this is an issue, and it's a bit unfortunate because a lot of people still go to PubChem as their primary source for metabolomics, and it was never intended for that purpose. On the other hand, KEBI, which stands for Chemical Entities of Biological Interest, was somewhat developed for metabolomics. So instead of having 50 or 60 million compounds, Kebby has 38,000 compounds. But there's nothing in Kebby that says it's specifically for metabolomics. It's just anything of, of interest. So they'll have some interesting buffer compounds. They'll have some interesting um, exotic toxins because it happened to be on the front cover of science. So they'll include things because that's the topic of the week or the compound of, of the day. Um, so again, it's not specifically designed for metabolomics, but it's typically, obviously, these compounds are more biological. You can, through KEBI, uh, search by their weight, and uh, it gives you a range, so it's actually a little more intuitive than PubChem to do the search. You can also do more advanced MS searches. So that's not just molecular weight, but you're actually looking for uh, molecular weight ranges. You might be able to look for positive, negative, or neutral ions. You might be able to search for MS, MS. Um, so HMDB, MassBank, Metlin, and also the NIST resource have that capability. So these are really intended more for people who know a little bit about mass spec uh, and are working with real mass spec data. So these, this particular slide is outdated. I think Allison can probably give me a more current <laughs> one. Um, but so the human metabolome database has gone through a bit of an upgrade in the last week. Um, but um, it does have the capacity to do searches with, with masses and to select what kind of ions and adducts you, you want to look at. Uh, to select subsets within the database, to select biofluids that you happen to be looking at. Um, so this makes it a fairly powerful approach. 
Um, because it's able to include what are called adducts, so these are things that when you do an LCMS run, you will pick up sodium or potassium or um, other kinds of chloride adducts, depending on whether you're neutral or, or positive ion or negative ion mode. Um, ammonia. Um, and these sort of contaminate your spectrum, uh, but they actually are real compounds and they'll have slightly different masses than what you expect. Um, with, that, um, with that ability to do adducts, it means that what you're dealing with is instead of not just 40,000 compounds, but perhaps up to 400,000 masses, um, which can be discouraging because uh, instead of just giving you one answer, it can give you a, perhaps a dozen or more. Um, the system allows you to select from a different bunch of databases, uh, or at least it used to. I'm not sure if you guys changed that or. <laughs> okay. So what happened was that. HMDB went through an upgrade last year, uh, and a lot of the mass searching capabilities that were there disappeared. <laughs> and so we we're just bringing those back now um, and enhancing them. Um, it also allows you to do some mixture deconvolution. So if you have a bunch of masses that you've seen, then you could enter them just like you had a bunch of chemical shifts and then potentially identify potential compounds. So in addition to the mass search, it also has MS-MS spectra. So it collected, uh, we've got several thousand experimental MS-MS spectra on, collected on triple quads and other instruments, QTOFs, as well as um, things at different impact energies. Um, so this is where you're trying to match uh, sort of a complicated tandem mass spectrum to an existing compound. Now, different spectrometers will produce different uh, intensities, and they'll also produce different ion fragments. But one thing that has emerged as a bit of pleasant surprise is that almost regardless of the instrument, you will still see the same pattern of masses, not intensities, but the same pattern of masses, which suggests that it is possible to identify a compound through tandem MSMS matching, not unlike we're doing with EIMS in GCMS. So that's, as I say, it's a bit of good news. It was a surprise. Uh, but now that people are starting to measure all these different compounds on all these different platforms, you know, with thermal, waters, Q-trap, ion trap, FTMS, with, uh, that we're seeing the similarity. Um, it's not perfect, but it's, it's, it's often good enough uh, to be uh, pretty confident. And we're also moving towards uh, standardization of, of having multiple collection ener uh, collision energies. Low, medium, and high, typically it's 20, 40, 60 is, is sort of the one that we tend to use as a community. Unlike the MS search, this is designed for searching for one compound at a time. So you produce a list of peaks. So this is making use of experimental data. You can go one more, and this is something that's just come out uh, last week, I guess. Um, so this is using prediction, um, where we predict tandem mass spectra for a compound. And um, there are some vendors that do this, um, but it's done in a fairly primitive way. Uh, Allison was involved in building the interface for this one, uh, so she can tell you all about it. <laughs> no, so what it is is a web server, um, and it has a large library. Uh, so every compound in the HMDB has had its tandem mass spectra predicted. Uh, so that's 40,000 compounds. Uh, we've also done the same thing for KEG, so that's about 30,000 compounds. They don't all overlap. Keg has a lot of microbial and plant metabolites. So, um, but if you have a mass tandem mass spectrum you've collected for something that you've isolated or have been able to collect, then you can compare this uh, tandem mass spectrum to the predicted ones and to see if there's a decent match. 
Now, predicted mass spectra are not perfect. Um, they, th there are flaws, um, uh, but the prediction algorithm in this case uses machine learning, and it's so far the most accurate one that we have seen. Uh, it has several options that you can do. Um, one that most people would be interested in is the compound identification option. If you click on that... Yeah. Yeah. It, it simulates the collision process. It, it imagines all the fragments. <coughs> That's right. Yeah. Like the B and the Y ions, so it can predict those. It can also do that. It does peptides. Uh, it also does lipids, and it understands and has learned the rules. It's also learned things like McLafferty rearrangements. It's learned a bunch of other things. So it can take many compounds, predict how they should fragment, predict some of their intensities, um, and uh, then it also performs a, a sort of a match factor it's using the Jacquard score to identify which compounds match most closely. So then you can use them to do the identification. That's right. That's right. So what you do is you can choose, well, this is the example, but you can enter your set of masses and their intensities. You can choose how many you want, how many hits you want to record. You can choose a mass tolerance, which is typical for how accurate is your mass spectrometer. Is it a triple quad or is it a QTOF or whatever? Um, and then you press go, and about uh, 15 seconds later, um, your answer is revealed. Um, and it shows the mass spectrum, it shows the level of matching, it shows the options, it gives you its overall score. Uh, it's all interactive and viewable. Um, this tool is being migrated into HMDB. I don't know if that was yeah, we're working on it. not quite done. Um, but as I say, you guys, the website's given. You can use that tool. Um, so the paper's uh, online now, um, and uh, I think it, it should be quite useful for the community. Matlin is another great resource. Um, and they have a very nice interface, uh, which I think that was, Allison, you guys were trying to build an interface similar to that for the mass matching. But what's nice about the Matlin resource is it allows you to pick and choose which uh, add-ups you want. Uh, so you can click on 2, you can click on 10, you can click on all of them. You can check, check which mode you want. And so you can measure your mass, uh, your tolerance, positive mode and choose a number or type of, of add-ups and then just go find. It will look up its database of spectra and there's about, um, I think there's 8,000, no, it's getting up to 11,000 spectra. 8,000, 8,500 are, are, are peptides, so about 3,000 probably correspond to what we call real metabolites. Um, um, so Take an example, submit, and it will produce a list uh, with their compounds, names, structures, links. And occasionally, some of them will uh, have uh, links to their tandem mass spectra. So Metlin not only supports the pure mass spec searching with just a single mass, but you can do tandem mass searching, just like HMDB. Uh, where you upload a peak list in Presco, and it will look through its its experimental list of, as I said, about 3,000 real spectra. Um, now, the limitation, of course, with Metlin is that it only searches its known spectra. It, has, it doesn't have predicted spectra. Um, so the ideal system would ha allow you to search both predicted spectra and the real spectra. And if the real spectra are, are there, it would take them. And if the real spectra aren't there, it would take the predicted ones. Um, so HMDB, or Met, Net, uh, the CFMID, only has predicted. Metlin ha only has real. HMDB only has real. Um, but there is a website called MetFusion, which actually has put the two together. Real spectra, predicted spectra. Um, now, MetFusion's predictions aren't that great, but it's a cool concept, and a lot of people like the concept and are using it, and have had some success. Problem is that I think MetFusion 
they ended up using pub chem, uh, which was kind of useless or, um, because those compounds are, as I say, none of them are, are metabolites. Metrin is not, is not uh, free to access. Like Metlin, no, it's free. It's free, yeah. Metfusion's free. All the ones I'm mentioning, except for the NIST AMDIS one, are, are, are free. And that's what we're sort of trying to emphasize in this course, just to make sure that people can try and access the, the free stuff. The free stuff, yeah. yeah. So I hope in another week or two, HMDB will actually have those capabilities of being both similar to Metfusion. Um, So I mentioned this already, but the fact is with LCMS, we, we do see adducts. And in terms of the number, uh, it's 80 to 90% of the peaks that we see in MS, LCMS are actually this junk data. Adducts or noise sources, multiply charged peaks or other things. So adducts, as I said before, are cases where the parent compound has somehow picked up sodium, potassium, chloride, or some other ion uh, because there happens to be a, a negative charge or a positive charge, depending on whether you're working in positive or negative ion mode. And so these are extra peaks. So for this one compound, we would see six peaks. These are the adducts and then the isotopomers. So if you didn't know that these are isotopomers, or if you didn't know there was an adduct, you would think you saw six, six compounds. But it's just one. Uh, and this is a typical scenario where uh, people claim, I've got 15,000 features. No, divide that by about 10. That represents the number of compounds. So these are a list of, of some of the adducts that people see. Uh, you can see that potassium, sodium, lithium, um, combinations, uh, methanol, uh, some with hydrogen, some with potassium, some with two sodiums. You can get e even more extensive ones. This is Oliver Fiend's addict table. It goes on and on. So these are all possibilities that can actually happen with a single compound. Now normally you wouldn't see all these addicts because people don't run samples with both sodium, potassium, acetonitrile, methanol, everything else. Um, but this does show you the range of possibilities that, that are there, uh, leading to extra peaks. Yes? So just from, from experience, we're just also sometimes taking answers like the specificity of the methanol or the acetonitrile. It would only run if you are running an electrospray with methanol as your solvent or acetonitrile with your yes. solvent. So if you don't have that as your solvent, then that will never happen. Yeah, if you are running with that, uh, it's rare, um, but evidently it has happened. So it's hard to know which ones are going to show up. Is there like any specific markers that people are willing to perform this kind of uh, audit? Certainly the potassium and sodium are very, very common. But in terms of which molecules to which addicts, we don't know. That's something that would have to be, I think, studied through databases, statistics, machine learning. It's, it's, it's a worthwhile thing. I think it, it would really help if we could figure out which compounds are more prone. I think ones that are very strongly charged, things that have phosphate, sulfate, other groups, those are much more likely to form sodium addicts versus something that, like a sugar or, or, or something that's just got a hydroxyl group or something like that. So there's the polarity is, is one indicator of how frequently they will form adducts uh, or, or how many types of adducts. Um, I think there's intuition people who've been doing mass spec for a long time typically will know which ones to, to look for more frequently. And certainly if, if, if we could put that knowledge into some kind of program, then I think everyone else would, would benefit from that. It's a little bit like it. It is. So basically, you add your add and you say, okay, I do just because it's going to take more time to search because your search space is going to be dark. That's right. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. 
there's a nice resource uh, called MZDB um, that's maintained out of Aberystwyth in Wales. Uh, a lot of people don't know about it, but uh, one of the pioneers in metabolomics, John Draper, set this up, and, and they have some nice nice tools and utilities for it. I like using this database a lot, and this web server. It's a little bit like Metlen, but it uses a different, um, different set of uh, data. Um, so you could put in a compound where you just have the um, a molecular formula, and then it calculates all the possible different uh, masses that may be consistent with these with these adducts or adduct forms. So, in addition to adducts, you can also have other things that happen. Again, just uh, as was mentioned about proteomics, you have modifications. So, you have acetylation on proteins and, and uh, um, methylations and things, uh, but as Molecules can also have, uh, at least in, in mass spec, neutral losses, where they lose you know, hydroxyl or water or something like that. Um, and these neutral losses are in addition to um, the adducts. So in addition to the, you know, the six peaks that we saw for the other compound, you could have all these other neutral losses, which produce another set of six peaks. So one compound just simply passing through electrosplay, you know, um, you still get a bunch of extra peaks. And to be able to identify these neutral losses also helps uh, to distinguish real compounds from noise. So Metlin, HMDB, MZDB are able to handle adducts. Metlin, MZDB are also able to deal with multiply charged uh, species. I think HMDB also does that or should do that. Uh, Metlin, though, is very good at handling some neutral loss uh, species, which neither MZDB or HMDB do. Nevertheless, when you do this sort of search um, with any kind of simple mass search or mass range search, given all these adducts and neutral losses, you're going to end up with lots of hits and therefore lots of false positives. So how can you sort this out? So there is software that you can buy It's part of many tools now to remove adducts and multiply charged species. There are software tools in many instrument vendor systems to help remove fragments, the neutral loss, and simple breakdown products. Uh, there are and is software tools uh, for removing and consolidating isotopomers. And there are methods for removing noise, just like when you submit a sample blank and or just doing a simple test to see whether technical replicates give you the same peaks over and over again. And the remarkable thing is that when people do these technical replicates, they still find uh, about a 20% difference in, in peaks. So there's just 20% noise, if you want, on top of noise from the blank sample. Um, so. Vendors will tell you I've got a great new instrument. I can routinely detect 15,000 features. Some people doing metabolomics also will say like the same thing. But if you do these processes where you start dealing with all the adducts and getting rid of those, you might drop by perhaps 3,000 features. Remove the multiple charges, which you could also say are adduct, you're down to 10,000 features. Deal with the neutral losses, uh, which is essentially the same compound, but just happened to lose a water or hydroxyl group. You're down to 8,000 features. All the isotopomers, you're down to maybe 3,000 features. Remove the noise, you're down to 2,500 features. So we've gone from 15,000 to 2,500. So that's a more typical and realistic value. So one-sixth are real peaks, or roughly um, uh, 15 to 20 percent. Then people will do this for a negative mode. They might also get 10,000 features. When it went down, you might get 1,500 uh, negative mode peaks. Overlap between the two is maybe around 50%. So net result, total number from maybe 25,000 features might represent um, 3,000 to 3,500 compounds maximally. There are tools to help with this, uh, some for vendors, but also uh, freeware tools like MZMine, uh, Magma, and I think MetFusion does that. So that's an important step, important process. 
Another thing that we, we need to do is, is to work with um, high mass accuracy. You guys have seen this table before, but this is one of the, I think, real important breakthroughs uh, that's happening because of technology. The fact that we have very, very accurate mass specs, technology is becoming much more accessible. When you have very accurate mass spec and mass data, you can actually calculate molecular formulas. So that's that third class of compounds we're saying we can get you a class of compound. Maybe not the identical compound, but we've got the mass. We should be able to get the formula. Now, the formula doesn't identify the compound, but it gives you an idea of what it is uh, or what it potentially could be. Um, so there are tools, MW Twin, uh, which is, I think, commercial, uh, where you can enter masses. Uh, HiChem, another one where you can enter the mass and it'll generate potential formulas. Uh, free one, which I just mentioned, MZDB. This one actually does uh, formula generation. Uh, it uses uh, some of the rules of seven that Oliver Fien described. And so it's, it's, again, another really useful hidden gem that most people don't know about. If you know the molecular formula, then you can enter that formula into a database like PubChem or Kebby or others. So from the mass, the accurate mass, you can go to the molecular formula. From the molecular formula, then you can start searching. Um, the idea is the molecular formula, if you've done it properly, has narrowed things down. It's used chemical information. It used the isotopomer information. It's not just using the mass information. It's, it's, it's restricted things further. So it's, it's actually smarter to search by molecular formula after you've done this filtering of, of mass to molecular formula. So PubChem supports it with the usual caveats that some of the things you're going to hit probably aren't, aren't real uh, natural products. Kebby supports it. Um, HMDB supports it. Many do. As I said, the, the molecular formula calculators um, use a bunch of, I think, intelligent rules, uh, ideas about what the restriction with single, double, triple bonding, given the, the atom types, atom numbers. Um, they also have some information about possible structures and topologies. And they can build that in. And this set is called the Seven Golden Rules. And Oliver Fien described these about six or seven years ago, and they've actually got a software package that does that. Uh, you can download. It's an Excel spreadsheet. And as I said, it's the one that's also migrated to um, MZDB. It'd be also helpful, I think, if, if it was an HMDB. Hint, hint. Right, Allison. Now, I guess we're down in the last few minutes, and I've got maybe another five minutes of slides. I don't know if people are willing to sit around or What's that? Okay. A green sticker, please, if you're okay with going for another five minutes of slides. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'll, I know we're thirsty and I'm famished, but. Um, so the point is that molecular formulas allow you to sort of shrink the space. So one estimate, if we just looked at um, all compounds that had carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, and phosphorus in them, which represents the vast majority of standard <coughs> organic compounds, and that there are things that are under 2,000 Daltons, we know there's at least 8 billion compounds that could be created that way, that are valid, that would follow the, the general structures. Uh, if you use the filtering process, the Sylvan Golden Rules or MZDB, uh, you can shrink that down by a, a factor of about 15. Uh, and then the ones that we actually know, uh, it's a much smaller set, around 700,000. And then if we just use the natural products, uh, we're shrinking down to about 50,000 compounds that would be potential from that subset. So using both molecular formula rules and the fact that the compound has to be natural, shrinks your space by a huge amount. 
And, and so the searches don't have to be as hopelessly large as some people think. Um, and that's why, at least for the CFMID and many other things, we're just choosing only natural products uh, to search for. No point complicating it. Uh, also, what was calculated from this same paper was uh, ideas about the frequency distributions for different formulas. So if you have a small molecular weight, there's far fewer formulas. A large molecular weight, many more formulas. So we can see this growing linear from molecular weight from 200 to 300 Daltons, from about 20 possible formulas to something like 70 or 80 formulas. So bigger molecules, more choice. The other thing that was pointed out is that if you include isotopic abundance, which you can with highly accurate mass spectrometers, um, and along with just good mass accuracy, if you put those two things together, you can hugely decrease your search space. So instead of having hundreds of molecular formulas, um, say at the 10 ppm level, if you're at 1 ppm level, which is typical with Orbi traps, um, that shrinks down the number of formulas, but then if you use the isotopic abundance, then you're down to just almost, you know, a number of formulas you can count on your hand. So huge wins if you're using the information from high resolution mass spec to restrict your formulas. So this is just an example where you're able to have a more highly resolved spectrum, you're able to see the isotopic abundance, and in this way, with a fairly large molecule, uh, get the precise formula, and only one formula. Things called isotopomers, isoleucine, leucine, methyl, 2-pentanone, 2-hexanone, molecules with the same um, molecular weight, same atomic composition, uh, also sometimes give you identical MS, MS spectra. And sometimes it's, it's sometimes hard to distinguish them. That's just a fact. Um, there are tools that will generate different isomers, uh, help you choose things. Uh, this is for dealing with completely unknown compounds. We still really don't have a good idea about how many different isomers there possibly are, so that's a scary issue. Um, millions are listed here. Uh, the number that are actually known uh, is listed on the far right, which only represents typically 1% or a fraction of that. So as I said before, a lot of the databases mix non-metabolites with metabolites, plant metabolites with animal metabolites, microbial metabolites with drugs, buffers with re other reagents. That makes it really problematic. There's a lot of papers where people have got completely nutty hits because they just didn't choose the right database. If you know which organism you're looking at, then, then use that information. Go to an organism-specific database. If it's not an organism but you know that you're looking for drugs, well then look at the drug databases. If you know you're looking at food components or phytochemicals, look at the knapsac or other plant-specific databases. Other ways of getting around this is to use, uh, rather than mass matching, people are moving towards uh, chemoselective labeling. Others are using very targeted mass spectrometry with, with kits. Others are using computer-aided structure elucidation. I won't go into this because we're short on time, but this is a really elegant approach that was developed by Liang Li, but there are other groups around the world that are doing similar kinds of ideas. It's similar to eye track for proteomics. It's using heavy label, light label. You're labeling or chemically modifying compounds. In this case, it's not with trimethylsilane, but it's a carbon labeled uh, dancyl chloride. So it, it reacts with certain reactive groups with high efficiency. Uh, you have heavy label, light label, uh, and just like with, with eye track, you can actually um, isolate compounds. You can look for paired peaks, uh, you can measure the intensities, so you can actually quantify them, and you can also be certain of which compounds are real and which ones are fake or false positives. Uh, this was done five years ago when they were able to identify about 120, uh, or I guess, yeah, 90 that they identified and quantified. They could get down to 30 nanomolar, 
Uh, they can also do this with carboxyl labeling. Um, derivatization, just like for GCMS, has some advantages with LCMS. You can convert a compound that was invisible to UV to something that is visible. Dancil chloride is very UV absorptive. Get much better ion efficiency. Uh, the intensity is increased by a factor of 10. Uh, because the tags are actually hydrophobic, you can do C18 uh, HPLC with them, and you get great, great separation. You can do this quantification, so you don't have to have authentic standards for every single one. You just need to have one chemical standard, uh, which is the dancil chloride. And as I said, it allows you to distinguish real peaks from fake peaks. And that's why, instead of seeing 15,000 features, typically with this method you'll see around 1,500 real peaks. There are kits now being sold for doing targeted mass spec. Um, they use single reaction monitoring, multiple reaction monitoring. Um, they have deuterated or C13 labeled isotopes in the kit. So you can be absolutely certain of the compounds that you're identifying. And you can also be very certain about their quantification. Uh, Hong mentioned she's developing and working on kits that way as well. So this is happening in many labs actually in metabolomics using the same idea of, of uh, SRMs and MRMs, making authentic standards, using little 96 well trays, using simple mass spec techniques, and it's very effective. And this is an example, again, measuring from a 10 nanomolar to almost 10 millimolar using these kits. Highly reproducible, uh, very consistent. The other part which we talked about was the idea of identifying unknowns um, or completely unknown compounds. And this is a technique called computer-aided structure elucidation, one where we try and predict metabolites uh, from known metabolites. That's called top-down. And the other one is essentially assembling metabolites from molecular fragments. That's called bottom-up. The top-down approach is actually something that's feasible. You can take the metabolites in KEG or HMDB or FoodDB or whatever, and you can do a, a, an in silico transformation. You can predict their sulfate, hydroxyl, glucuronide variations, the phase one, the phase two transformations, the microbial transformations. So you can go from maybe 10,000 endogenous metabolites to about 400,000 metabolized transformants. And then from there, you can predict the mass. You can predict the masses, the formulas, you can even do the tandem MS. And so now you've created a, a synthetic database of potential metabolites. And then you can compare your compound spectra to those synthetic metabolites. So this is done with a database called My Compound ID. Um, it computationally metabolized all the compounds in the HMDB, and the net result was about 400,000 theoretical metabolites. So you can go to the database and uh, run it, uh, and it lists all the different reactions that it considers. It doesn't have the structures, it just simply created the masses using a little bit of chemical wizardry. Um, and if you do the search, uh, you'll get a whole bunch of hits. Um, you can do the searches just for unmetabolized ones, so no metabolites or reactions, one reaction, two reactions. Two reactions generate a synthetic list of about four million compounds. Um, this has been really useful. People have found that the number of hits that they get from MS studies uh, go up by a factor of three or four, which is huge. <coughs> the other approach is the bottom-up approach, which is we know a little bit about chemistry. Let's create synthetic molecules by computer and see if we can also predict their properties. Uh, this is traditional computer-aided structure elucidation methods. It's how we actually determine structures of novel compounds using NMR and mass spec. Um, it's very difficult. There's only a few programs that actually do this well, and there's only one company that has a viable one that works. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about it because it as yet really isn't, isn't feasible. So with that, we are done, and I think we can take a... 30-minute break. <laughs>